and Tory donor Frank Hester is being investigated by West Yorkshire Police for the allegedly racist remarks he made about former Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott. It's the latest blow for the Tories who have since been under pressure to return the 10 million quid given to the party by Hester following the scandal. While launching his local election campaign in Derbyshire today, the Prime Minister avoided answering when challenged on whether it was time to return the money. Well, obviously, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on police matters, but as I've said previously, what he said was wrong and racist, and he rightfully has apologised for it. There you go. Well, it comes amid dire electoral predictions for the Conservative Party as it continues to trail behind Labour in the polls, dropping to just four points ahead of reform. Meanwhile, channel crossings continue to rise sharply. Of course they do, with more than 500 migrants arriving on Wednesday, putting this year's total at 4,306 arrivals. Uh, joining us now is polling expert and politics professor Sir John Curtis. Uh, welcome to the show, Sir John. Always a pleasure to have you on board. I mean, in the light of uh, this new problem for the Tories, the uh, Frank Hester donation, uh, Frank now being uh, investigated by the police, that puts it into a different light. Plus, uh, Wednesday, a record number of migrants came across. One was stabbed, 510, uh, and the total now stands at 10% higher than this time last year. So that isn't looking good. Uh, plus all the other problems. Uh, uh, he's launching today his local election campaign. <laughs> I mean, how are things faring for the Tories, do you think? Pretty bad, I would have thought. Yeah, the honest truth is, if you take the average of the opinion polls, and they've all of them been conducted uh, since the budget that was meant to try to restore the Conservatives' fortunes with that 2p cut in national insurance, the Conservatives are now running on average at 23%. That is even lower than the 25% to which they fell on the same calculation in the immediate wake of the downfall of Liz Truss. So if anything, the Conservatives have been going backwards so far this year, rather than going forward. So, and, of course, the problem they face is, indeed, uh, they are in the local elections at the beginning of May. And basically, the whole of England and Wales has some kind of election or other to vote in, although it's a bit complicated as to who gets what where. Um, but the, his problem is that the most of the contests that are being fought over this year were last fought over three years ago in May 2021, which was the same day that Boris Johnson not only made about 200 uh, gains of seats uh, in the local elections, he won the Hartlepool by-election from Labour. The Conservatives were still were ahead of Labour in the opinion polls. So his problem is that because he's defending such a good baseline, Rishi Sunak is at risk of suffering quite substantial losses in the local elections. And I suspect, however, the one thing he will be hoping for is that perhaps reform will not be fighting these elections that widely. They're certainly not thought to be fighting uh, one of the sets of elections, which is for police and crime commissioners. We'll wait and see how many of the local council elections they fight. So that perhaps is the, the one silver lining for him. But basically, he's going into these local elections with the Conservatives in as weak a position as, as they have ever been in this parliament and defending a rather good set of results three years ago. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned about reform and fighting the local elections. It makes me cast my mind back to uh, 2013, I think it was, when UKIP came third in the local elections and really did, I think, put themselves on the map. I think you're probably right in suggesting that reform aren't going to be contesting them across the board in the same way. Uh, but where is reform support actually coming from? Because I'm tempted to say, with that four percentage points difference between the Conservatives and reform, according to the latest YouGov survey, um, that actually it only would require reform to go up 2% if they're taking all of their votes from the Conservative voters of 2019 to put the parties uh, at, an, a, a, at, a, at a level. Um, but is that right? Am I misinterpreting things? Are reform actually also no, taking you're, you're, Labour you're, support? You're not far off, although um, I think what we should say is that YouGov, uh, as, and I'm not criticising them, but as a polling company, they have tended to have the Conservatives lower than many, though not all other pollsters, and to have reform somewhat on the higher side. If you take the average at the moment, the Conservatives at 23 are still nine points on average in the polls with reform uh, running at 12. But still, that, that's more than enough for the Conservatives uh, uh, to uh, worry about. And the truth is they are uh, predominantly coming from the Conservatives. Indeed, reform are now picking up rather more voters 
uh, from people who voted for the Conservatives in 2019 than our Labour. It's about one in five 2019 Conservative voters who are switching to reform now. Maybe a few of these would, if reform didn't exist, would have expressed their discontent with the Conservatives by voting for Labour. But for the most part, these are folk who, yes, they are concerned about immigration. They uh, believe in Brexit, although that's not all that concerns them. They, like those who are switching to Labour, they're also concerned about the health service. Um, they're also pretty concerned about the state of the economy. So the truth is, the discontent from which the Conservatives are suffering, which is essentially to do with the state of our economy and the state of our public services, that's something is also seemingly pushing people in the direction of reform as well as to Labour. That said, well, I think we might now be asking ourselves, did the government make a mistake last November and December in focusing in particular on the issue of immigration, which is certainly one of the things that particularly concerns uh, reform voters, um, because we know this is a very difficult uh, situation to deal with, so far as asylum seekers are concerned. And simply latching on to the fact that the numbers were a bit lower last year was perhaps rather grasping at straws, and that in now focusing on the Miranda Bill and getting us all to talk about it, it's simply reminding us that, in fact, immigration to this country, despite what we were promised in the 2016 referendum and the 2019 election, is basically higher now than it was uh, four years ago. Uh, the Prime Minister now uh, doesn't like to talk about uh, the migrant crisis uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but he did mm -hmm. appear on the BBC a couple of days ago on the uh, news uh, announcing that uh, 2024 will be the year of the bounce back and the economy has turned a corner. Uh, this is where uh, he is uh, resting his hopes and dreams, isn't it? The economy sure. and uh, a recovering financial situation, not only for businesses, but for people all over the country. Uh, it, it, does he stand a chance on that uh, level, Sir John? Well, I mean, his hopes are not entirely without foundation. Um, you know, inflation is now lower. Uh, wages are now going up more uh, than our uh, prices, at least uh, across the board. Um, though economic growth is still pretty anemic. Um, the problem, however, he faces is that even if people start to feel a little less bad off, and that's probably the way around to put it, given how much we've suffered in this parliament, not necessarily because of the fault of the government, but given how much we've suffered, it's probably a question of do we feel less badly off? But even if that is the case, the real question is, can the government claim the credit in the eyes of the electorate for the improvement that occurs? And the truth is, at the moment at least, all the opposition seems to have to do once we start a conversation and an argument between the parties about the economy is to simply remind voters what happened under Liz Truss and to argue, at least, that the reason why we are where we are is because of the uh, Liz Truss's fiscal event. And it's very, very difficult for the Conservatives to shake that off. The, the brutal truth is, is that no government in the post-war era that's presided over a market crisis of the kind that Liz Truss's fiscal budget um, uh, stimulated has managed to survive at the ballot boxes in the next election. So, I mean, Mr Sunak faces a poll lead that is uh, the Labour have is no, no poll lead this close to an election has been has been of that size has ever been overturned. No government that uh, has presided over a market crisis has survived at the ballot box. Mr Sunak has to defeat the tide of history if he's going to remain prime minister at the next election. But maybe he'll be lucky and maybe he will. It seems to me that the Conservative Party have very little wriggle room and very few uh, places in which they can turn, given that, let's say, the party's sort of tropes and legacy legends are we are the party of low taxation, we are the party of a stable economy, we are the party of strong borders. These three things seem to be the big issues at the doorstep and they are all happening as a result of 15 years of Conservative incumbency. Yes. I mean, you know, of course, the reason why, um, uh, you know, taxation has been as high as it is, is because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the reason, again, why the health service is in the state as it is, is again, uh, arguably the result primarily of the COVID pandemic, although there were signs of difficulty beforehand. You know, the, the government, you know, let's be fair to the government here, they have been dealt a difficult hand. Some of the migration is a consequence of the events in Ukraine, events in Hong Kong. Um, so it's not all uh, a result of simply Tory mismanagement. Um, but the problem uh, that they face is 
that uh, eventually the public are saying, well, there's enough, however, that you've got wrong. Uh, you've given us two prime ministers, one of whom ended up being somebody whose honesty was we, we could we we came to doubt. Another another one who seemingly couldn't run the economy effectively. So whatever the misfortunes that the government has suffered, and they are quite substantial, in the end, a difficult hand has been played rather badly, and that for the electorate is perhaps the crucial bit. Uh, Sir John, you are by some margin uh, the most esteemed and admired pollster in the country, and deservedly so, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, is there any chance at all that the Tories can win the election? And that is on the assumption that it's probably going to be late October, early November. Is there any way they can uh, turn this juggernaut around and win the election? And if so, how? Well, I've already said to you that, you know, they've got to defeat historical precedents now to be able to win the election. So you can see, I don't think it's terribly likely. What I will say to you is that the chances of the Conservative Party forming the next government are less than 5% and st statisticians define less than 5% as something that is extremely unlikely. Um, so, uh, and that's not just simply because of the size of Labour's poll lead. It is also that even if the polls were to narrow and to narrow quite significantly, uh, the Conservatives don't have any friends inside the House of Commons. Apart from the DUP, nobody else is going to be willing to help them to run a minority administration. You put all that together and you can see why I think the probability of them being in office after the election is indeed now vanishing small. Yeah, and, and finally, Sir John, I mean, aside from a black swan moment, which could, you know, potentially destroy the Labour Party and turn the fate of the Conservative Party around, I think there's a sort of big disagreement happening inside CCHQ over whether yet another change of leader could do the trick and <laughs> save them from total annihilation. Where do you think the public are at in that? If they suddenly put some fresh and new at the front of the Conservative Party, might it see an upswing in support? Or would it just be a case of the public go, you can't do this again, you've already tried this three times in the the last year? Well, it would have to be somebody extraordinarily charismatic, somebody able to provide a very uh, clear sense of direction for the government, and arguably one of the criticisms of Mr Sunak, he's not managed to do that, and to uh, suddenly persuade the public that there is a vision for the future of this country under the Conservatives is better than the one that's being offered by Labour. My problem is that when I think of the people we talk about as possible successors, Penny Mordaunt or Kemi Badenoch, for example, I think one has to say that at best, the belief that, the, that they have the qualities and capabilities required to achieve that remarkable turnaround are certainly not proven. And meanwhile, yes, the problem is, uh, do how do you really persuade the public? Well, actually, we gave you two prime ministers, three prime ministers, none of which we thought were any good. But could you please vote for the fourth one? That's going to be a very difficult argument to pursue. Bit of a long shot, bit of a long <laughs> shot. Uh, Sir John, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time.